Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for another Hope Beyond the Headlines. I am absolutely thrilled this week to be here with Pumzilem Lambo Nkulka, the Director of UN Women and an Under Secretary General at the United Nations. Uh, Pumzile has been an inspiration for me since my young days as an anti-racist and anti-apartheid activist. I moved to South Africa um, when Mandela was released and shortly after Pumzile became um, a member of parliament in the newly free South Africa. She went on to become um, the deputy president under President Mbeke where she was the highest ranking woman in the history of South Africa. And of course now she is leading us uh, in the 25th anniversary year of the Beijing platform um, with generation equality at UN Women. There is um, perhaps no more powerful a woman on issues of racial justice and gender justice and multilateralism. And I'm absolutely honored and thrilled to be here with you today, Pumzile. Thank you. Wonderful to be with you. Um, I'd also just like to mention that we're very honored and privileged to partner with UN Women, both in Northern Iraq, where we were privileged to have a UN Trust Fund partnership to eradicate violence against women. And actually also in policy work, um, we were meant to be launching this unheard, unseen report with you, uh, Pumzila, on March 8th at mm -hmm. the Council for the Status of Women, which of course was one of the first international meetings that had to be canceled because of COVID, but we are determined to continue the advocacy work together. Um, mm -hmm. And something I'll, I'll come to that soon, but I wanted to start um, with, you know, this is titled Hope Beyond the Headlines and the biggest headlines right now are around the continued structural racism in the United States. Uh, and you spent decades in the anti-apartheid struggle. And so I'd love to hear from you, from your years living in South Africa, the struggle there, bringing people together. Um, do you have any lessons or advice or thoughts for us in the United States and the UK and the rest of the world as we overcome our own structural racism? Um, first, let me just say again, thank you uh, for having me. I really think the biggest thing is that people, and big and good thing is that people are protesting. They are taking it out there they are amplifying each other's voices. They are identifying uh, what it is they want to see gone because you cannot make racists love you overnight, but you can remove some of the structures that make it possible for them uh, to use their racism to hurt you. And uh, you can also provide uh, policy and laws to to make them accountable. So it's good that people are protesting and people must be very clear in the demands that they want and they must not accept token reforms. Thank you. I think that's really powerful. And one of my reflections on work in South Africa, I don't know if you agree, is that you need both so much. You need the, the policies and the laws, but you need the citizens and you need the social norm change because if you don't have both together, one doesn't achieve the other. South Africa is one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. At the time it was passed the most progressive constitution in the world. And yet if people hadn't remained out on the street, um, mm -hmm. even with people like yourself in government, difficult to implement. Yeah, it, it can never happen without uh, people speaking for themselves, telling it in your face and protecting whatever little gains uh, uh, they make because it's very easy also for those gains to be eroded if you're not paying uh, attention. Uh, it's also good uh, when people are able to really be united on the things that they want uh, uh, to change and they are able to say, this is our minimum and the type of change that we, we, we want uh, to see. And it's good that people must feel they have done it themselves and for themselves. Yes. Um, so I want to move on from racial justice to gender discrimination, which of course are intricately linked. Um, and I want to start personally with you and your personal journey as a leader. As I mentioned, you held, uh, you were the most senior, the most highest ranking woman in the history of South Africa when you became deputy president. And I can only imagine that that wasn't 
an easy path. And there are many women who aspire to follow you in leadership. Do you have any advice to young women seeking leadership or middle-aged women like me <laughs> in leadership? How did you overcome the discrimination you faced as a black woman, an African woman, a woman? Um... Uh, I mean, uh, I faced discrimination under apartheid as a black woman and as a woman. And gender discrimination as a woman up to now, that, that's still very much on the cards everywhere. Uh, most of it's subtle now because once you become a leader, people are not as blatant. Um, but in my leadership journey in the context of uh, South Africa, because uh, uh, we had uh, a history of uh, active participation uh, of, of women in the ANC, in the South African government, that was not an issue. And I was very clear that when I have the power, I will use it and I will not allow anyone to trivialize me. Yeah. And, uh, and the men that we were with uh, within uh, government, I guess took the cue because President Mandela uh, was quite a, a strong uh, representative of government that was very much at ease with the, the empowerment and the place of women in society. And so there wasn't that possibility to do that. But you know, subtle racism and gender uh, is always there. And uh, when that happens, it's always important to call it out. In my role as the Minister of Mines, which is a very macho industry, yes. Uh, I mean, it would be that I would go to uh, visit a mine and, uh, and obviously I would like to see the conditions of service for workers need to go underground um, and so on. In some cases, you would arrive and uh, people would want to speak much more to my director general than to me because they thought he understood better what we were talking about in, you know, about this man's job. Of course, I think that it, this is such a, a, a dangerous uh, job, especially in, in South African mines that are very deep and underground, it's not open cast. Uh, so when you are a minister, you really want to get a good feel. And I did not want to be spared the inconvenience uh, of doing that. And once you do that and you, you demonstrate your resolve, the next man you go to, people know exactly that uh, they will not mess with you. So it's also important to stand one's ground hmm. uh, and to set the tone and be ahead of the agenda. For young women who want to run for power and for office of whatever kind, it really is very important not to waste your time while you are sitting on the table. Use it, and don't have to be overbearing, but use this, own the space in as much as you can that is actually quite important. It's really powerful. It's also difficult for women who are raised to please people and to be nice. Yeah. Um, it takes you, a lot you of time. Uh, uh, there is no, miss, no more miss nice. And then you, 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 know, you can then get into the place that you were born to be in very quickly. That's beautiful. The place that you were born to be maybe requires that we don't always be nice. I like that a mm. lot. And that's uh, an important journey. And you certainly have um, to, to insist on going down a mine, to insist on be the person spoken to um, is what's given you the strength to be there at the UN Women. It's, it's, and I do want to move to that. I want to talk to the structural issues of gender discrimination globally. Um, it has been 25 years since the Beijing platform um, was agreed. And yet, um, as your UN uh, Women reports show so the best, we still have um, wage gaps. We still have some kinds of employment uh, uh, laws in over 100 countries where women are discriminated against. We lack control over our own bodies. We have what you've called the, sh the shadow pandemic of violence against women. 2020 was meant to be a landmark year in which um, you were launching, well, you did launch generation equality to really catalyze movement to finally achieve these commitments we made 25 years ago. Can you um, 
talk to us a little bit about what you think it's going to take now, the pandemic um, at the forefront of everyone's mind globally in the US, um, the quite important movement for racial justice as well. What, what, what is your perspective on what we need to do to advance gender justice um, at the UN and globally? Um, I, I think it's, it's really very important that we hold on to 2020 as a bumper year for women uh, and save whatever we can of, of the year as, and also leverage whatever opportunity that uh, are being made open by the crisis. Because, you know, as you know, every crisis uh, sometimes presents opportunity that do not exist in any other time. So, you know, don't waste a good crisis. Yeah. Um, any, any pandemic and the health crisis of this size also has um, a gender dimension. It's important also uh, to be very deliberate about disaggregating uh, the impact of women and, and making sure that uh, you deal with it uh, in a very specific way. Uh, so we are choosing to say we are marking the 25 years of Beijing. We will mark the 20 years of women, peace and uh, security resolution 1325 as well, but we will integrate it with the COVID moment. Um, if you think of generation equality and the themes that we are uh, going to focus on in generation equality, which are linked to the areas where we have uh, the biggest problems still for gender equality, they are the areas that in the, in the COVID situation have been uh, exposed uh, as some of the underlying inequalities that impact on women. So we had the theme in generation equality, which is uh, gender-based violence. Guess what? COVID, that is the issue. So in responding to COVID, we will be developing also the long-term response that is needed to actually flatten uh, the curve of uh, GBV in COVID, post-COVID, until we reach a point that is acceptable to us. In uh, generation equality, we had economic justice. Guess what? COVID has brought us to the fore. And now, in responding to uh, uh, COVID, uh, countries are putting in place a fiscal st stimulus, social protection, uh, and other measures to deal with poverty some short-term, some long-term. The jobs that are affected by COVID are the ones that uh, have a significant number of women. The care economy has a lot of women and the care services in general, uh, tourism, hospitality, you know, all of those have got women in dealing, and, and they're precarious jobs. So in dealing with these jobs in COVID, we must fix them for the long-term. Uh, if you're dealing with technology, you know, the lack of digitalization in poor countries and the, uh, the, the divide, uh, digital divide, we have to fix it for the school children in, de in technologically deprived countries for COVID and for going forward, which is what we intend to do. Uh, in so we're trying our best to make this moment count, not just for the immediate, but for the long haul. Yeah, that's really powerful. And, and um, I think I want to come back to a couple of things you said. I'm sorry, I'm losing my battery. Let me just connect. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to come back to what you talked about in terms of making the most of a crisis. It's what our founder Zainab Salbis has spoken about for all the 26 years since we were founded, is that a, a silver lining of war, a war is horrific, and yet in building back, there's an opportunity, whether it's Rosie the Riveter, which is in the icon of the US or the UK, mm. or whether it's um, uh, Rohingya women that we've been working with or Syrian women who, now that they have been displaced, they're actually out of the house, they're actually meeting other women uh, through our trainings, which are vocational trainings around skill sets. They are 
uh, learning an opportunity to get income. Perhaps their family is accepting that because the family is so desperate for needs. And so you try to make the most of these incredibly difficult situations. One of the things about COVID, however, is that rather than getting people out of those enclosed spaces, the lockdowns that many governments have put in place are forcing women in. And you've mm -hmm. talked about what that means for violence against women and your statistics and your beautiful ads on this have shown that, you know, violence is going up all around the world because of both men and women are under such pressure and in this cauldron and stuck in their homes. Um, but I'm also worried about the economic side. And I would love to hear a little bit more from you on the perspective in play, uh, that because women are less able to get out and claim those economic opportunities possibly. And in places where we work, uh, Northern Nigeria, South Sudan, Eastern Congo, Northern Iraq, um, Afghanistan, I'm worried about the economic side and famine and food insecurity um, as much as, uh, and, and continuing ongoing health issues you know, pen, uh, malaria, other issues. And I, I would love your perspective on how, what is the appropriate response of the international community um, as NGOs, as UN, as citizens? How do we balance out the need to protect people, um, but also the need for, the majority of women are in the informal sector. Many men are day laborers. How, how do we balance um, and, and what is your perspective on the relative importance of the different issues and how we have a cohesive response? Uh, I don't think that uh, there is a cohesive response because no, there's no playbook for this. Mm -hmm. We are making it up as we go and uh, countries are responding as best as they can. And in some cases, they're not trying hard enough. You forgive countries if they are challenged but they are trying their best. We are obviously very frustrated if they don't even try. And you, we actually need to be very serious about saving lives and saving livelihoods because both are important, which is such a difficult uh, space to be in. So we do need a global response. Uh, where we are all protecting each other because a virus anywhere is a virus everywhere. Yeah. Uh, you cannot defend the WHO in this time because we need an institution like this to fight successfully. We need a people's vaccine in order to create the possibility for us to just have the chance to move on uh, with, li with, with life that is not full of danger every time we step uh, um, outside. But in this moment where everything is just uh, uh, falling apart and high risk and, and, and so on, leadership. Really, we need to insist on leadership uh, that can figure out how they move on day to day, balancing all those difficult things that you that you that you are saying, mm -hmm. uh, and inclusion of women in those uh, processes, uh, so that the and I'm not saying that women will have all the answers. They will also be struggling like everybody else, but they will also be able to see uh, some of the issues that uh, others will not see if women are not there. So uh, I, I cannot give you the answer that is a blow by blow for every issue, but I know that if you, if you have women there uh, in the right space, uh, it definitely makes a difference. And if the leadership that is there is truly there in the best interest of uh, the people. I mean, I think we've learned something about New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, when the leader has the interest of the people is not settling scores that have nothing to do with the crisis that you are in. People are suffering, but people's even coping mechanisms, when they know that their leader has got them, has got their back, it makes all the difference. Uh, we have actually seen even in a small country like Namibia, 
uh, uh, the, 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 the prime minister, who is a woman who has been the leader in the Namibian fight, uh, really doing a fantastic job. And as a result, uh, uh, Namibia is in control. The, the, you know, the, the, the pandemic is, is not running ahead of them. They are not all in the clear, but they've been able to go for days without new infections. So this is the moment all of us in the women's movement to really see this issue of leadership as a very, very important deal breaker in times like this. No, and I, you know, it, it brings us full circle to where we started, because when you speak of that kind of le leadership that we need, that is strong and decisive and yet inclusive and um, from emotion, I think mm -hmm. not only of New Zealand, but I also think of the mayor Atlant of Atlanta. I mean, yeah. her coming out and making decisive actions, mm -hmm. immediately saying we're going to reform the police in these ways, mm -hmm. having her female police chief step down because she wants the best for, for that city, um, speaking of her children, speaking of her fear for her, her family, that for me is, is the best of women's leadership, mm. where you have decisiveness mm. and, yeah. and connection yeah. to heart. Mm. Um, mm. And so I um, want to ask a question we ask everyone on Hope Beyond Headline, which is related to this, which is what does hope for the future of women look like for you? Uh, Ah, life without violence, mm. really. Uh, this is the most dehumanizing form of discrimination that women and only women suffer because they are women. Uh, a, a human rights violation that does not get prosecuted in most cases that is most tolerated even by members of the family that, that the woman uh, lives with. And in many cases, uh, uh, women suffer this violation in their own homes. This for me is so critical for us to achieve because there's so much that women are able to do when they are not under this pressure, the depression that comes with, 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 with all of this that they live with, uh, where they are afraid to go home. Uh, they are not safe in their workplaces. They are not safe uh, outside and no one cares to take it up. But let me also say, um, I and am glad many of my colleagues in, in, in our country offices uh, we have come, we are so frustrated about this issue of violence. We have come to the conclusion that this thing of making violence a responsibility of ministers, of women, is misplacing the issue. You are taking women in their nice ha ha handbag and high heels, and you are saying they must go and fight murderers. And they themselves are targets of these murderers. While they are there fighting this, they are just as exposed as anyone else. This is a big issue that needs the same reaction in any country that would happen if they said, we have terrorists attacking the country. Women's approach, uh, because of what they are equipped to do in those ministries with their little budgets, their reduced uh, uh, and their programs that constantly are being reduced, their lack of status in some countries in those posts, and you make them do the most difficult job. Uh, it is just not fair, and it is just not right. So we have to define whose responsibility is this? That's an excellent uh, point because, of course, there's economic impacts. We are denying the full potential of women and our ability to contribute to the economy. There's health impacts, um, the so the impacts are across all of the ministries, all of our mm. societies. Yeah. Um, in fact, Women for Women was founded we, um, to serve survivors of violence. We don't ask women, you know, were you raped or what violations do you have? Because it is 
we but we seek out women who are the most marginalized the most vulnerable at the most risk and the solution is economic empowerment social empowerment women coming together in groups to be able to give each other psychosocial healing sharing stories understanding that we are not to blame understanding that together we can overcome this but also it's more and more in the last 10 years, like you at UN and Women, starting men's engagement work at the fore to say, this is not women's responsibility to stop. This is the responsibility of the entire society. Yeah. And I yeah. think you said on Instagram and you say often, and the places where we've seen the most progress are where men are also engaged as allies and we need mm. leadership from, from all fronts. Yeah. yeah. And we need perpetrator accountability. And men, because they represent the perpetrator group, they need to uh, come out and help. It is boring to be a good man who is a bystander. <laughs> it serves nobody to be a bystander. They have to be counted and to do their work and not expect a prize for that. <laughs> uh, because you, you will not praise a fish for swimming. Men, real men need to step up and be in the forefront of this fight as do uh, white women and men need to stand up and be an ally and a forefront of the fight against racism as well, because that's also equally damaging to all of us, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So Pumzile, um, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I want to let you go back to leading us to <laughs> deal with all these issues globally, but is there any last thing that you would like to say? Well, um, just to say that, uh, uh, you know, in my language, as, as you know, if you've lived in South Africa, grandmother is a gogo. -go. For gogos -go like me, uh, who have been at it for so many years, we may be feeling tired, but I just have news for all the gogos. -go this is not the time to walk slow. We really have to stay with this and co-lead with young people. This has to be as intergenerational as possible but uh, this is not the time to to take it easy this is the time to to, to intensify that's beautiful i have to re I, you know living in south africa when i went from being called sissy to being called <laughs> mama i was like oh really <laughs> but now I pr i'm proud and we can learn from the younger generation and we can also stand alongside and 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 lead together so i think that's a very powerful uh, powerful way to add i do want to say to all of you who've joined us um, if you want to find out more about the amazing work UN Women is doing, obviously go to their site. There's excellent reports on how COVID-19 is impacting some incredible statistics on unpaid care. Um, one of them, what, 12.5 uh, billion hours a day is how much yeah. unpaid work women are putting, $11 trillion in the economy. So there's some incredible statistics and information you can use in your advocacy. If you'd like to find out more about Women for Women, please come to our site, womenforwomen.org. We have an opportunity to both support one woman at a time, practical assistance, so she can rebuild her life after crises, whether that is COVID or war. Uh, but also a final invitation, uh, if you've enjoyed today's discussion, this Saturday, June 20th, we have a She Inspires Me live conference where we will all day long uh, be speaking to over 20 different speakers. Our founder, Zainab Salbi, uh, activist Annie Lennox, actresses Sophie Turner, but also lots of grassroots activists. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Pulzile. I uh, yeah. so respect and honor you and thank you for all the work you do in South Africa and globally. And um, I look forward to a time when we can see each other in person again. Hey, Tiano, thank you so much. And thank you also for all the work that, that, that you do. Uh, all the best and please stay healthy. Uh, observe all that you have to observe, inconvenient as it is. We will. We'll stay uh, together, we're stronger. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye.